A public funeral service is currently underway in Troy, Alabama, the hometown of Congressman and civil rights icon John Lewis. Today's service marks the beginning of a six-day celebration of his extraordinary life and legacy. Monday, Congressman John Lewis will lie in the state capitol at the U.S. Capitol, but first, tomorrow morning, Lewis will cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge for the last time in a special procession. The same site where he and hundreds of other protesters were brutally beaten during a peaceful march from Selma to Montgomery over 50 years ago. Joining me now is MSNBC political analyst John Meacham, an author of the upcoming book, His Truth is Marching On, John Lewis and the Power of Hope, MSNBC legal analyst Maya Wiley, social justice activist Mark Thompson, Aaron Haynes, editor-at-large at the 19th, and MSNBC political contributor Jason Johnson. Thank you guys for joining me. Uh, for this very somber block. Aaron, I have to start with you, and I hope you don't mind me revealing some of our private conversations, but Aaron and I are both daughters of Atlanta, and we've been watching this coverage and talking and tweeting, and one thing we always said is we want to hear from folks from Atlanta, from Alabama, from the black southern belt of this country to, to talk about uh, John Lewis, and so I can't think of anybody better um, to start this conversation out with me than you, Aaron, and I'm so happy you're here. I want to ask you, uh, as a daughter of Atlanta, uh, what John Lewis's leadership meant for the city, not just the city, but really the state, but Atlanta specifically, because you and I have talked about how magical that place is, being a black-run city at every level, at the state level, um, at the local level, um, the, the, the influence that black voters from Atlanta have had on the politics there. What are you feeling as we lay this man to rest? It's good to be with you. And it is, frankly, um, very um, comforting to see that, that, that uh, Congressman Lewis is getting the home going that um, he deserves and, and that we weren't sure that he was going to get, frankly, in the midst of a pandemic, right? But I uh, hear you have him making multiple stops across the uh, across the uh, country, really, uh, so that so that millions of Americans can, can give him the proper uh, goodbye that, that he has certainly earned. Uh, the, the home going uh, here to, today in Troy, Alabama, his hometown, uh, we do uh, try to take ownership of Congressman Lewis uh, in Atlanta. His constituents of the 5th District have certainly known no other representative uh, since 1983. And so we do feel like in a lot of ways that he is ours. And he was a big part of, um, you know, kind of what a lot of us uh, talk about when we talk about the Atlanta way, Aaron, right? I'm um, I just, part I'm of so sorry the, to uh, interrupt you. Uh, I promise I'll come back to you, but I do want to go to Henry Grant Lewis. John Lewis's brother is telling a, a story about him right now. Let's listen in. After the event was over, we was together and I asked him, I said, John, what were you thinking when you gave me the thumbs up? He said, I was thinking this was a long way from the cotton fields of Alabama. <laughs> so, and those are the memories that I have with my brother. Uh, we would have these late night conversations and early morning conversations where he would call me 11, 12 o'clock at night and he'll ask me, are you asleep? And I say, no, I'm not asleep, John. But actually, I will sleep. And he'll say, have you heard from Freddie or Bibby? Lately, I said, yes, talked to him a few days ago. Well, I think I'll call him. I said, don't call him tonight. Call him tomorrow. I said, because it's, it's late. But that's the John Lewis that we grew to love, and our family natural would miss him. Uh, but he was at peace. He was at peace, and he was ready to meet the Lord. Thank you. I'm standing right here. Okay. That was uh, Henry Grant Lewis, John Lewis's brother. He was, uh, he had many surviving siblings. Um, Aaron, I'm so sorry that I had to interrupt you, but I do want to allow you to finish your thoughts um, as, as we lay him to rest. 
I, uh, and, and listen, certainly don't apologize for letting John Lewis's brother uh, uh, speak there. Uh, no, I was saying that, that uh, Congressman Lewis really was a part of, of the uh, kind of poli black political machine in Atlanta that, that did ensure, uh, you know, that the city has had an unbroken line of black mayors, uh, you know, six in a row uh, since, uh, you know, 19, 1973. And so, uh, you know, Congressman Lewis is passing, that, that generation passing. Uh, you know, obviously that means so much for the country, uh, but it also means a lot, uh, you know, for the city of, of Atlanta um, as, uh, you know, folks of, of his influence uh, and stature uh, are, are passing, uh, passing from the scene and, and really, uh, you know, really calling on those of us who are left behind uh, to, to talk about how that legacy is going to be maintained in their absence. And I think that, that that's already something uh, that folks are seeing. Uh, but, but certainly it, it's something that has taken on a new sense of urgency with the congressman's passing. I couldn't agree more. Um, right now, that is Rosa May Tyner, the congressman's sister speaking. I just want to listen in for a sec to see what she says. Trevor, he reminded us that it was good, Trevor, necessary as Trevor. See something, say something, do something. Thank you. Okay. All right. I, I want to bring in uh, my, my friend, Dr. Jason Johnson, in this conversation. Johnson, uh, Jason, like you, you and I have both lived in uh, Atlanta before, so you're not quite a son of Georgia, but you've spent significant time there. Um, looking at this passing of the torch, you know, I say that Congressman John Lewis was a torch bearer, and in this moment, it feels like he's passing the torch. What do you think his death will mean for the city of Atlanta and really the country? And, and, and Tiffany, this is a really, really key question, because, again, yes, I'm not a son of Atlanta. I'm more like a, a play cousin of Atlanta. But even at the time that I lived there, what you recognize is that people really cared about having a living hero there. People really cared about having an individual who hadn't sold out who hadn't lost his passion, who still remained committed. So many of that generation, not only have we lost them, which has been sad, whether it's Julian Bond or C.T. Vivian, not only have we lost them, but many of them, they, they sort of moved off into the sunset and they were distant from people. John Lewis was everywhere. I don't know, I mean, like it, it, Kim Kardashian might be the only person who was in more Instagram photos than John Lewis after he passed. He meant so much to so many people in that city. And so his loss, is going to be really hard for people to get over. And I think Nakima Williams is a fantastic replacement. Um, she's a wonderful, meaningful politician, and I think she will continue with John Lewis's legacy, but those are huge shoes to fill, and there's gonna be an extended, extended case of mourning in that city for such a magnificent man, both personally, policy-wise, and politically. Uh, I should just say Nakima Williams is who Democrats have selected to replace him in his remaining term, and she will be on the ballot in November and likely uh, to fill his seat in the heavily Democratic populated city of Atlanta. Um, she's also a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. I know that matters to a, a lot of folks out there, so I wanted to mention that. Um, John Meacham, I, I have to go to you. You have a very well-timed book that's coming out next month, and I think something for me, when I see the footage of Congressman Lewis on that bridge and, and look Look at him squaring off with law enforcement officers um, suffering a skull fracture in the process. And then I look at footage today um, of a president dropping mm -hmm. smoke bombs to, to clear protesters in front of the White House. The parallels are striking. It, it creates for me what feels like a wrinkle in time. So as a historian who spent time with him and, and studied his life, um, what, what do you make of this moment in history that we're witnessing uh, a, a baton? torch, a torch pass, as I've called it. Yes, I wonder if it's so much a parallel, uh, and tr but tragically, I wonder if it's more of a continuum, mm. uh, that there are iterations of our worst selves that continue to be part of our national experience. And one of the reasons we are honored to honor Congressman Lewis today is because he was a leader of the forces of good, the forces of light. And there's nothing sentimental about what I'm saying. Uh, it might be if you were saying it about anyone else but John Robert Lewis. Uh, but the man who's lying there in Troy is the man who came out of Troy, 
with an intuitive sense of right and wrong. He, it was instinctive. He grew up in a, in a part of Pike County called Carter's Quarters, named after his family. And his great-grandfather, Frank Carter, was born in slavery. And so this was, and, he, and uh, Mr. Carter lived until I think uh, John was eight or nine. So it, slavery was not an abstraction to John Lewis. He would go into Troy, into town, and see the Jim Crow signs. And he had an instinctive revulsion to it. When he was about 10, an uncle, Otis Carter, took him to Buffalo to see some relatives. And it was like walking into a movie, he said, because here were black people and white people in the same place. They lived next door to each other. They lived out their lives in the stores and downtown and the, the soda fountains together. And those were the experiences that he had that became informed by what no conversation about John Lewis is complete without pointing out that he believed fundamentally in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He believed that the world could be brought closer into harmony with what uh, the New Testament called the kingdom of God, what uh, Martin Luther King and he called the beloved community, and that if all of us could get our dispositions of heart and mind in the right place, justice could come down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And that may sound like a uh, lying in state homily or a Sunday school lesson. It was an ambient, tangible, daily reality for John Lewis. And it's what kept him going into those, well, actually, to be clear, he didn't walk into the state troopers and the posse men at the Pettus Bridge. Right. They came at him. Right. Let's remember that, right? And that is, a, that is a moment out of the Bible. Those are Hosea Williams, and John Lewis, and Amelia Boynton, and Charles Moulton, and uh, Andy Young was running things from, from back at, at Brown Chapel. These were martyrs and saints for the faith. And they walked and walk among us, and they inspire and they illuminate. And what we're seeing, to go back to your uh, question, what we're seeing anew is that we are summoned once again to use those lessons to try to keep pushing, as Dr. King said in the motto of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, that's a plug for Atlanta, since I know we're, we're have, we all have to be <laughs> pro-Atlanta here. I'm from, I'm, I'm from Chattanooga, so I, just, I was just oh, over right, the state line. Oh, you're right. You're our neighbor. You're right up the road. <laughs> I hope you'll, I hope you'll, you'll smuggle me through customs. Um, you know, the, the SCLC motto was, we're going to redeem the soul of America. That's right. That's and that's right. what John Lewis lived and died to do. Uh, let me just let our audience know that's Ethel Mae Tyner, uh, John Lewis's other sister, who, who is speaking now. Um, be before we uh, go to her, I just want to say I, I appreciate your point, uh, John Meacham, ab about the continuum um, of, of what we're saying. Actually, let, let's listen into her for a second to see what she's saying. When the clouds would come over the sun, he would start singing and preaching. And there's a song he would always start with. There's a dark cloud arising. Let's go home. Let's go home. And he was also afraid of the thunder and lightning. But he stood by. He always was a fighter. And you know, now when I look at all of the Accolades, the pictures that I see all the time, and I think about where he came from. Umba means umba, always. And you know, and I don't want to mention all of his accolades, because you all already know him. You all know these, you already know it. But he came from a humble beginning, always humble and respectful to others. So to my brother, Robert, this is not a goodbye. It's just a different 
kind of hello. And you know, when we talk, he always said, I said, how are you doing? And he had this, I'm well. So rest well, Robert. Rest well. Thank you. That was, that was uh, John Lewis's sister speaking. Um, Mark Thompson, I, I want to turn to you on this. I think what John Meacham talked about um, reflected on the role of the black church, really, that, that the role that they play in the civil rights era. Um, what role do you see the church playing now? I think as we come into new activists, um, you were someone who sat on stage with uh, Congressman Lewis. You sit on stage with him as he commemorated Bloody Sunday. You knew him well. You're a son of the civil rights movement. And so you know how steeped in the black church uh, we are. W what role do you see the church playing now? And what does his death mean to you as, as we usher in this new era of activism? Well, thank you, first of all, for having me, Tiffany. You know, it, it means a lot. And I think that the church as I believe it is doing, must rise to the occasion as it did during the civil rights movement itself through the SCLC, which John, who John worked with closely as a part of SNCC. Um, and it's really interesting that this would all be taking place today. Um, John is a historian, but let me just share a couple of things. Um, John Lewis was a Black Lives Matter activist before Black Lives Matter was a hashtag. Today is the 79th birthday of Emmett Till. And most of us believe that the modern civil rights movement kicked off after the death of Emmett Till. If Emmett Till had lived, he would be a year younger than John Lewis, who we are memorializing today. And when that movement kicked off, John stepped out there with SNCC. He became a freedom writer. Uh, and then there was Selma. And it's no longer metaphorical. It, it, it's history repeats itself. So we're really looking at, at parallels. And so in this moment when the church and when the younger generation looks at what's going on and it seems so overwhelming, we went from Ahmaud Arbery to Breonna Taylor to George Floyd. That's what was going on in 1965, February 4th, 1965. Malcolm X stands with John Lewis and Snick in Selma, and then he dies 17 days later. February 15th, 1965, C.T. Vivian is beaten in that famous video by Sheriff Jim Clark, Black Lives Matter, law enforcement. And then February 18th, 1965, Jimmy Lee Jackson is killed as George Wallace is enforcing um, a, a moratorium on and prohibition of nighttime demonstrations. What's going on in Portland right now by a president who is literally uh, mimicking George Lewis, uh, George Wallace, and fancying himself after George Wallace? After that, this was the plan, and this was what will happen tomorrow with John's remains going over the bridge. The plan was to march Jimmy Lee Jackson's casket from Selma to Montgomery. That was the original plan. And then that plan gave way to what happened on March 7th, 1965, and John Lewis and Hosea Williams leading that march. So that was a Black Lives Matter march in memory of Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jimmy Lee Jackson giving his life for voting rights in Selma, Alabama, and to stand up against a, a fascist governor in the person of George Wallace. So as we talk about this, I believe the church has a duty, and I think it's taking on that responsibility yeah. to draw those parallels, to see how history is repeating itself. We can never stop. And I think the generation that John Lewis has bequeathed his legacy to right. is doing the same thing and will do the same thing. And, and let me just say one other thing. There'll be all, we'll see all the wonderful ceremonies over the course of the week. But we'll also see people there who are, to this day, still enemies of John Lewis. If you don't pass um, a new Voting Rights Act, you're an enemy of John Lewis. If you're not going to release the money for states to come up to speed to have proper mail-in balloting by November, you're an enemy of John Lewis. And it's also very timely that we are literally tomorrow, when he goes across that bridge, 
tomorrow will be a hundred days from the election. That's right. John is right. In our faith, we believe our ancestors walked with us, and I believe John Lewis is still with us. Thank, thank you for, for that, Mark. I, something interesting that you bring up, though, I think is a, a good point. I want to go to Maya Wiley on this. Uh, so John Meacham, our, our historian on the panel today, um, talked about John Lewis's lineage. But I, I want to just remind folks also that John Lewis's great-great-grandfather, after Reconstruction, um, at his first opportunity, registered to vote. And this is something that uh, the great historian Henry Louis Gates uncovered. Um, between John Lewis's great-great-grandfather and John Lewis, no one in that lineage had voted but those two men. And Henry Louis Gates tells this beautiful story about when he told him that, that Congressman Lewis just broke down in tears and said, I guess it's just in my blood. As we prepare uh, to continue to fight this battle over voting rights, um, what does his death mean for you, uh, Maya, as, as someone who is also from a lineage of people who, who fought so hard uh, to, to, to vote, but also the hypocrisy that we've seen some people share their thoughts and tweet out these responses. Even the Republican governor um, of Georgia, Brian Kemp, tweeted out a response, uh, th you know, thanking John Lewis for a, a life well lived in his service as he actively suppresses votes. What, what do you make of this landscape as we lay this man to rest but continue to wage a battle in his name? You know, John Lewis used to say, you have to make a way when there's no way. And he never stopped doing that in his life, whether starting in Rock Hill, South Carolina, where he stepped into a beating by trying to get the enforcement of a Supreme Court decision that said you can't segregate public transportation and accommodations. He did that as the youngest freedom rider in 1961. But he didn't stop trying to make a way on voting rights, as Mark has said. It was, it's a shame that in this country, and I mean a, a shame and a scandal, that uh, John Lewis, in, in his later years, was still fighting for vo basic voting rights for people who are black, people who are Latino, people who are elderly, people who are students, because we've seen as a result of the rapid expansion of black voting, particularly in 2008, particularly to vote for Barack Obama, that the answer response from the Republican Party was to organize voter suppression and to do it in a way that was exactly the kind of thing John Lewis was fighting, which was to hide the fact that you're trying to prevent black people or Latinos from voting by just making it really hard, knowing that it'll make it harder for voters. So today we fast forward and he was trying, as Mark said, to get legislation through to correct the tremendous tremendous injustice of a Supreme Court decision that decided to look past the growing voter suppression that we were even hearing Republicans say out loud were to keep black people from voting. Um, and just recently we had Donald Trump's own campaign operative say that Republicans had been responsible for voter suppression. Admit that. So we can have a public admission from Republicans and yet they will still try to wrap themselves in the mantle of our constitutional rights to vote. And John Lewis has told us, make a way when there's no way because black votes matter too. I love that. I want to go back to John Meacham, our historian on the panel. Um, it's very fitting that tomorrow Alabama state troopers will be carrying Congressman Lewis's body across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, which shows uh, in some ways how far we've come, but in many others how far we still have to go. Um, in your book, in the research for your book, was we've always heard so much of, about that day, um, Bloody Sunday, as it's come to be known. In your research for your book, as you came to tell this story, was there anything that you discovered that would be surprising to those of us who thought we may have known every day, everything that happened on that day? There were three things um, about Bloody Sunday. Uh, one is uh, Reverend Thompson is exactly right. Uh, it was in the wake of the Jimmy Lee Jackson uh, uh, murder uh, that uh, James Bevel was a part of that too, uh, in order focusing on how do we how do they press forward uh, in, in this moment? Uh, Selma had been ground zero for so much of this uh, work. 
So the th three things about, about the march. One was Charles Malden, a young man who was there, remembered the th sound of the thwack when the troopers' billy club hit mm. John on the skull. Just remembered the sickening sound of that. And it wasn't, as Maya was saying, Lord knows it wasn't the first time. Uh, Bernard Lafayette, uh, the wonderful friend of John's and a fellow freedom writer, said, I don't know what it was, but they always went for John's head. And both he and Diane Nash, uh, who were Nashville colleagues of John, said they were amazed he survived as long as he did, uh, because he was always on the front line. So there was the sound of the thwack, that was one. The other was the full engagement, and this is an important thing to bear in mind, particularly in this moment, the FBI. Right. The, the J. Edgar Hoover's FBI believed the civil rights movement was a communist front, essentially. And the number of agents who were there, uh, the number, the, the, the wiretapping, the surveillance state that unfolded, uh, some of the best accounts, most interesting accounts we have of the march are from the FBI agents who, who were there. And in fact, they went and interviewed John at uh, Good Samaritan Hospital and uh, the next day recorded his height down to five feet, five inches and a half. Uh, so this sort of precision while never really apparently looking at what they were actually doing by monitoring the movement. Um, the third is at Brown Chapel. John goes in. He says he doesn't remember how he got back. Uh, he has the fractured skull. He says, if Lyndon Johnson can send tr sends to, to sort of a, a meeting, Stokely Carmichael described the after action meeting at Brown Chapel at like a wake in a mash unit. Uh, John says, if Lyndon Johnson can send troops to South to Vietnam, why can't he send troops to Selma, Alabama? And then he begins, he's woozy. He's already thrown up on the bridge. Uh, which may have been from the head injury, could have been from the tear gas. Uh, he's woozy. They take him to the Parsons house, the Parsonage next door. And Worth Long, who had been a, a, an army veteran uh, and, a, and, and a, or a military veteran and a, a medic, got, put, sat him in a high back chair in the Parsons dining room and they took him out uh, as if it were a stretcher. They realized they had to keep his head uh, elevated because of the injury. And the troopers, the posse men, uh, there were many sort of uh, deputized folks there under Jim Clark, the sheriff of Dallas County, had ridden their horses up on the steps of the church and really surrounded Brown Chapel and that complex. And it was Worth Long who came out and is reported to have said, using his military vernacular, because he thought it might work with the troopers, we have a man down and I need to get him out. Mm. And that parted the way. And, that's, and he ended up uh, at Good Samaritan. Small details, but it was 55 years ago. Right. In America. Right. In a nation engaged in what John Kennedy called the long twilight struggle against Soviet communism, the nation that four years later would put a man on the moon, the nation that 20 years before had helped defeat the forces of tyranny in Western Europe and in, and in Asia. And so if we don't tell the old story, we can't make our new story. Right. Because what's so amazing is John Lewis is a saint and people may begin to tune out and start to see stained glass and, and angels but remember what a saint really is a saint isn't superhuman a saint is is a human being who's just better than the rest of us right a sinner not a savior and I believe as firmly as I believe anything about American life and American history that John Robert Lewis is a saint in that tradition.
And, and you know, those small details help paint the picture. So I'm very much looking forward to reading your book. You talk about COINTELPRO, uh, the FBI uh, effort to spy. Yep. Um, I write about that a little bit in my book as well. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And you also reference Reverend Bernard Lafayette, who will be joining me tomorrow um, as we commemorate okay. the life of, of John Lewis as well. So I, I hope folks will tune in. I do want to bring in Dr. Bernard Ashby, a cardiologist in Miami, Florida, who had the privilege to meet Congressman John Lewis. Doctor, I'd love to hear this story. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. And, and thank you for uh, that interview with uh, Bruce Lavelle. I mean, the contrast between him and, and Congressman Lewis couldn't be any more stark. And I appreciate you calling out the BS. But Congressman Lewis, um, you know, he impacted me personally, but I mean, he impacted the world. My, my story begins when I was actually in Congress at a, uh, I'm sorry, I was, in, I was in, in the halls of Congress and I just happened to bump into Congressman Lewis and uh, myself and my friend, Dr. Al Alan Vival, started talking to him. And during the course of the conversation, he basically, you know, opened up to us and invited us to his office. And it was during that time that he told the stories about Bloody Sunday, about the civil rights movement. And he just so happened to have some pictures from that, that day. And I heard you guys describe it, but he described it to us in vivid detail of his skull being fractured. And after this conversation, he, he looked at us and told us that he was in awe of us for what we have done. To me, uh, that, you know, that was, that, you know, I can't even talk. That, that's, that's how, how um, taken aback I was because this, this is the gentleman that fought for my right to be a physician. And he told me and told my, my colleague that he was in awe of us. And this white coat that I have here is because of John Lewis. Hmm. I wouldn't be here if it was not for John Lewis and these other free, freedom fighters who basically put their lives on the line to fight and rebel for my freedom to be an American. So I will forever be in debt to uh, the civil rights, uh, the folks of the civil rights generation and everyone ha that has fought for us. And I just want to make, make a special um, uh, point to talk about uh, what's going on in the healthcare system. Uh, you know, I, I feel like it's, it's my mandate to address the healthcare disparities or the quote unquote racism that's going on in the healthcare racism, healthcare industry. And therefore, uh, you know, John Lewis's memory is forever with me. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk about that. I, I love, thank you for talking about it with us. That was beautiful. Uh, we are out of time. So thank you, John Meacham, Maya Wiley, Mark Thompson, Aaron Haynes, Jason Johnson, and the amazing Dr. Bernard Ashby. Memorial services for Congressman Lewis.